Welcome to the Keto Geek Podcast. Let's do this. Health, nutrition, fitness, low-carb lifestyle. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to Keto Geek Podcast. Today, we have Ryan Lowry from ASPI, which stands for, um, what does it stand for? Uh, the Applied Science and Performance Institute. Thank you so much. And you are, I believe, the president of ASPI. Is that correct as well? Correct. Awesome. All right, Ryan, thank you so much for being on board. You are an awesome human being. As soon as I saw your posts on Instagram, on Twitter, I was like, this guy needs to be on here. You're spearheading something that is beyond just nutrition food. You're inspiring people. You're actually, you're actually driving a change and motivating a lot of, especially the younger generation that I think require a little bit of extra push because we've been shoved with so much information. And I think you're one of the voices of reason uh, and uh, uh, inspiration for a lot of the people uh, in this world, especially the younger generation. So... First of all, let's talk about you. We'll start with your narrative, if that is okay with you, unless you want to be 007 and maintain your secrecy. <laughs> no, man. Well, thank you. Thanks so much. I really appreciate it, and I'm honored to be on the show and, and really looking forward to diving into a lot of these, a lot of these topics uh, with you. All right. Um, just, to give a, just to give a brief background uh, on myself, I, I guess... Uh, I came up and I was always involved in sport. Uh, so throughout high school, um, I played baseball, basketball, football, and then I really went off to college at the University of Tampa to play baseball. Um, so I played baseball there and really always tried to understand and find out how can I optimize my body. And with that came, how do I study different training techniques and how do I study proper nutrition? Uh, and very early on, I met one of my uh, best friends and colleagues and now business partner, Dr. Jacob Wilson. Um, and he kind of took me under his wing very early on in my career and was like, hey, why don't you get involved in research? Uh, so my early on, my freshman year, even of college, I got involved in different research projects looking at a variety of different training variables and nutritional interventions. And it really just got me excited for how can I apply this to myself and and my family and my friends to really optimize their performance. And so from then on, we've kind of just been the one-two punch and the, and the duo to really find and study a lot of these different questions, um, like some of the ones we're going to be talking about today. And it's really led us down a path where we eventually got introduced to some colleagues. Dr. Dom D'Augustino is a really good friend of ours, and, and even Dr. Jeff Volick, uh, another really good friend and colleague of ours, who are doing research into low-carbohydrate diets and, and this concept known as a ketogenic diet. And for years, I was always told as an athlete, you need to eat copious amounts of carbohydrates in order to fuel your performance. Like I can remember when I was playing, I was I was consuming at minimum two weight gainer shakes a day, and, and those were at minimum probably 150 grams of carbs like per shake. <laughs> so I was eating insane amounts of carbohydrates to try and fuel my performance. And so that kind of threw me for a loop when I heard, hey, what about this concept of eating like less than 50 grams of carbohydrates per day? Like how can someone perform on that? And so we, the really where this started for, for Jacob and I is we were at a conference, the National Strength and Conditioning Conference, um, really great conference, and we heard Dr. Jeff Volick speaking. And he was speaking on a lot of the great research he was doing um, with endurance athletes and low-carbohydrate diets. And so after his presentation, he gave a phenomenal presentation on the benefits of a ketogenic diet. And afterwards, someone stood up on the mic and said, uh, Dr. Volick, what research do we have on ketogenic diets and resistance training? And he goes to, he looked and he goes, you know, to be quite honest, we don't have any uh, right now. And so almost, almost identically, Dr. Wilson and I looked at each other and we said, you know what? we have a lot of work to do. Like this is our realm. We work with resistance training populations. This is something that we might want to dive into and look at ourselves. And from then on, it's just been a, a journey of exploring down this road of, of how to optimize a ketogenic diet for people who are resistance training and how all different kinds of components that come with that. And, 
ever since we've just been fascinated by the ketogenic diet itself. And I believe that's the advent of Applied Science and Performance Institute, correct? Exactly right. Absolutely. Awesome. And just to add a little bit, I've also held a high regard for all of these people that you've mentioned, especially Dr. Jacob Wilson as well. I remember I used to go to bodybuilding.com and there was this one uh, workout plan that I followed through and through, uh, which was through him. And uh, I was in the same boat. Uh, My style of resistance training was all about let's load up on carbs and power through. So when Dominic D'Agostino showed up on uh, Tim Ferriss's podcast and started to do to practically shatter everything that I have had known about diet in general, I, I was just fascinated by it. So just to go off from, uh, go with ASPI, what is exactly happening in your world right now as far as research is concerned uh, and uh, some of the papers that you guys are working on? Yeah, absolutely. So basically here at ASPI, well, first off, Jacob and I, we were originally at the, the University of Tampa and eventually we, we've always had this idea and this concept of something bigger uh, and implementing a change in the world beyond just in the academic world. Uh, and I think the academic world is phenomenal and, and fantastic in what it does, but there's, there's limitations in some regard into what you can do. And so we always had this concept of how can we get our voice and our research out to the world? Um, because one of the biggest tragedies in academics is we have a lot of colleagues who can who do incredible work, fascinating research. The problem is that the way it's written and where it's published, only other academics ever get access to that. And for 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 Doc and I, that was that was unacceptable. We're like, how do we really change the game literally and take what we were doing in academics and now make it on a global level. And so we stepped out of academics, created the Applied Science and Performance Institute, which is a 22,000 square uh, foot facility that really bridges this gap between the science and application using literally the latest state of the art technology um, that we know of. So we're doing a ton of different research and then taking that research and broadcasting it out, whether it's on social media, um, publishing it in various different journals and presenting on it at different conferences to the world in an easy, understandable, digestible manner so they can then take this information and utilize it and apply it not only to themselves, but to the people around them. Yes, and you know that I I love what you guys are doing, especially on the social media uh, platform, where I consistently see posts from you guys having these infographics that are, by the way, I need to figure out how you guys do that. I want to do that too. Uh, But (laughs) those are really amazing and so informative and so concise and referenced to scientific studies. It's such a great way to adapt to the new age of uh, the the current generation of how people absorb knowledge in these bite-sized portions in a very, uh, when everybody has such a short attention span. So kudos to you to break into it and promoting something really scientific to some of the younger people in our country. So, wow, <laughs> great well, thank, work. Thank, thank you. And you know what? I think it, I think that's very important because um, that's something that, that we had talked about for a very long time. And, you know, teaching to classes um, for 45 minutes or even or even over an hour, hour and a half, you've learned very early on that people have short attention spans um, and to no fault their own. It, it's 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 just we that's we have short attention spans. Now we're in this digital age where things come so fast and something can change uh, in an instant. And so creating information which we can still educate masses amounts of people uh, in an easy, understandable manner that they can take in and digest in just a couple of seconds of scrolling through Instagram or Facebook or Twitter or whatever it is, um, is really something that we're pushing towards and really going to continue trying to get out there in order to help bridge that gap that we were talking about. Awesome. Another thing that I wanted to talk about, uh, was that there seems to be challenges as researchers, for you guys, uh, to actually get your papers published. And I noticed in your article that it's a rigorous grind to get something that may seem 
pretty obvious and gets verified immediately, but it's just like a tedious process of getting your papers into uh, the right hands and then having it peer-reviewed and so forth. So what are some of the challenges as researchers that you guys are facing right now? Oh, that's a, you know, that's a really great question. And I think it's great you bring this up because the peer review process is often misunderstood. Um, so a lot of people think, hey, I run this study, say I were to run a study today, um, and they go, well, why isn't it published next week? <laughs> and, and so they kind of have this misconception that things just get published immediately. Well, the way a, really a study works is first off, designing a study takes a lot of time within itself, figuring out, all right, what variables are we going to look at? How are we going to control for this or control for that? Are we going to look at their diet? Who's going to work with them on their diet? All of those things come in the study design. And then you actually need to run the experiment. So running the experiment, making sure you're monitoring everything as, as closely as possible, controlling for any confounding variables. You gather all this data and then now it's time to – really hammer home the whole point of now let's get into the publication process. So you analyze the results, um, you do a, you do a write up and then you finally, once all of that is done, you can now finally submit to a journal. Um, and so what that journal does is once the journal receives it, they'll distribute it amongst, um, their peer, their reviewers. And the thing to keep in mind is these reviewers are just experts in in the field experts in in the certain category that you're presenting on so you're kind of at their um leisure so to speak in a sense that if if i'm a, if they're on vacation or they're busy working on a research project for the next month it might not be a month it might be a month or two months before that reviewer even looks at your paper um to get it back and now when you have multiple reviewers doing that you can imagine that process of all right, well now they've reviewed it. They want to get it back to you, um, and there's some there's some revisions that they had requested. Now it takes time for you to revise it, send it back to those reviewers, and now that whole process starts over again. So, the process of peer review is definitely one that's that's challenging. I think, in in all honesty, I think we're fi- we're coming to a time now where peer review is phenomenal, um, and getting these papers into these published journals is is essential. But Really, where the real peer review process comes is when people who are who are intelligent online are really looking at these studies, breaking them down and trying to understand them themselves is we live in this global age of, of technology and, and information on social media where people now review studies on social media. They break it down and it takes a unique eye and a unique understanding to really be able to take these studies, break them down, look at it and go – Hey, well, this is this is an interesting insight. Um, now, if I want to build off of this, how do I now do a different type of study uh, and either further this work or, or try and look at it from a different light? So, what would be some of the ways this entire process could be expedited? Do you have any ideas regarding maybe people who are in this industry could get some insight into it? Because I'm sure you were like, "Oh my God, I've been spending five months on this. Can we please have this done in a week?" <laughs> You know, it's it's I, w- I wish it was I wish there was an easy answer. And the challenge is this is that because the peer review process is what it is, there are some journals who have um, different ways of reviewing. So there are some journals where you can pay a thousand, two thousand dollars to have it expedited by reviewers. But a lot of people don't have that will or or necessity to go, hey, I want to get this sped up. So I'm going to pay to do this. And so. It becomes very tricky um, in regards to publishing. And now there's even what we call pay for play sort of journals where you can literally pay their fee and you're bound to have it accepted, which is dangerous within itself because now it becomes really anyone can quote unquote publish. So we need to be very skeptical in a sense and, and look deeper and educated more so on what qualifies as a good journal and then how can we then like you said, speed that process so that more and more of these papers can get out to the masses and then get this information out rather than it just sitting on a shelf somewhere published in a journal that no one's really going to have access to or really be able to understand because it's its own kind of language within itself, the scientific language. How do we take that and allow more people to understand it and, and practically apply it? You know, what would be really awesome is if we can find ways in which, let's say, 10 or 20 or 100 people 
can make some sort of a group investment, have a subscription plan where they can tap into these journals that seem to be pretty much invisible unless you pay an exuberant amount of fee. I think I was looking at some of the papers and they cost like $35, $40 to just look at them. Uh, Mm -hmm. And that's really not in in the budget of most people. So what do you have for people like myself or people who are just consumers and they want to access some of the research? What can we do? What kind of resources do we have? Uh, You know, that's a great question. One of my favorite ones, I mean, ResearchGate uh, is is a great place where a lot of researchers kind of upload their papers when they're published. Um, That's really the best one that we have as of now. Or... I mean, honestly, what, what finding people um, that are trying to do what we're trying to do is really take a lot of these groundbreaking studies and then put them in this type of infographic concept of how do I break this down and provide you the most important pieces of information um, that you can get in an easy, understandable manner. Or the last one is um, is if you have a friend or a colleague that's at a major university like um, a lot of these big universities have accesses to uh, insane library databases. If you just have their their information and they can sh- and they can find a paper for you, oftentimes I'll reach out to a friend or colleague who's at one of these larger uh, universities and they have access to tons of journals. Um, and I'll always bug and be like, "Hey, can you get me this paper?" And and usually they're very uh, cooperative. So those are really the three I'd say best ideas that I have as far as research gate, having a friend or colleague at a university, or really looking for the people who are driving these conversations um, on social media and getting trying to really get these uh, brand new studies and information out to the world. Sounds fantastic. The reason why I was asking was because nowadays we see a very much, there's a drive to for people to empower themselves. They look at an article on, let's say, New York Times or Huffington Post, which is commercially accessible to everyone. But once they delve into the finer details, you start to notice that sometimes those articles are cherry picking certain information from the study. And that can be very inaccurate and very, very misleading. And I think in these last 20 to 40 years, because of this bias, it seems, or whatever the reasons were, there has been a decline in the health or things are at least not getting better. Uh, to for for our people in this country and basically around the world in general, so that was one of my concerns. Uh, and you know, education's one of the most powerful tools in the world. And and one of the things that Dr. Wilson and I talk a lot about and and preach to people is really become your own scientist. Um, and because of this digital age. Uh, it's it's been fantastic for getting information out there, but it's also been very dangerous in giving people a voice who may not necessarily need a voice on a large platform. And like you said, it can come in the form of cherry picking certain things and and putting information out there that can be misleading um, in some regard. And we just need to be careful of that and, and do our best um, to sift through it and really find for myself, why don't I just be be my own scientist, try and dig in, trust trust who I trust as, as leaders and authorities in the field um, to help me through that process. But at the end, I need to be my own scientist, read these papers, try and get a better understanding of how I can apply it for myself because that's truly what's really going to matter at the end of the day to try and sift through things that are cherry picked or things that may be misleading titles that we see all the time on news stories or, or all these different channels and really get down to the, the nitty gritty and the roots of what truly went on in that study. Yep. So going off this further, uh, let's get into a little bit of controversial stuff, which is as researchers, you guys in the low carb and keto world are dime a dozen, even less than that. Probably you guys are like the very rare, tiny minority, uh, very (laughs) rarely seen in the sun, more like uh, the myth of a vampire at night sort of uh, (laughs) appearance. So what are some of the dogmas or challenges that you guys are facing? And uh, is there a way we can help? You know, you know, one of my favorite quotes uh, by Aristotle, and I put this in the article, it says, if you want to avoid criticism, there's three things, say nothing, do nothing, and be nothing. And I really think 
that resonates and that's that's extremely powerful um, because at the end, no matter what field you're in, if you're in technology, if you're in nutrition, if you're in exercise, if you're trying to study and push the boundaries and really do something blue ocean, so to speak, where no one ventured to where no one's ventured before, there's definitely going to be feedback uh, and there's definitely going to be warranted criticism. Um, some that's warranted and some that's unwarranted. Uh, the thing is just to keep your head above the water and realize that no matter what you do, as long as you have the right mission and the right, um, you're doing things the right way, the right processes, like at the end of the day, I can go home, look myself in the mirror and go, I'm doing what I'm doing to tr really try and uh, change people's lives through science and innovation. And if we can continue pushing down this road and really push these boundaries, that's all that matters to me at the end of the day. So I think at the, what, what it's going to take is collectively coming together. I think we're warranting a, a important conversation that um, certain nutrients maybe aren't necessary like we had, like we had thought. Um, they might be looked at as more of a tool. Uh, for instance, carbohydrates, maybe we look at them as a tool rather than an absolute necessity. So I think the education is really what's going to allow this conversation to spiral out and really be the megaphone for getting this message out. And what the key is this, and I'm glad you brought this up. The key is this. It's not a war. It's not, hey, I'm on the carb camp and I'm on the low carb camp. Um, and we're battling constantly. That's definitely not what's going to progress the field forward. It's going to be like, hey, how do I understand your perspective? Taking, but how about you take a step into my shoes and understand this perspective from this angle and realize how it can be applied for this situation. And when we do that, when we take this empathetic approach of of being like, you know, what? I can see this from your perspective, then they they don't necessarily need to work competitively. They can actually work synergistically for different situations and individualized. Definitely. And I see that quite often on my feeds as well, uh, as I follow various people and, um, it's, it, it gets a little interesting. So now let's get a little technical as far as, uh, everything is concerned. One of the things that I wanted to ask you is that, and just for, this is just for people who are new to the ketogenic or low carb lifestyle is can you gain muscle and lose fat on keto? And how is it different? I think that's more important. How is it different from the traditional high carb or the other diets that are out there? Uh, yes. And to answer your question, yes, you can. <laughs> um, you know, <laughs> that's one of the studies we set out to do um, in resistance training individuals. I mean, we've known back in the early 2000s, Dr. Jeff Volick did a lot of work where he saw with in, in just in, in overweight in men and women that they were able to gain muscle, uh, a substantial amount of muscle and lose fat. Um, so where we kind of really pressed into the issue was in the resistance training world, which is a whole nother um, area. It's a sensitive topic of what if you take people who are highly resistance trained um, and put them on a low carbohydrate ketogenic diet, can they gain muscle? Um, and lose fat. And so that's really what the premise of our study is. But prior to that, there's been numerous studies that have shown even when you just alter your, your intake of fat and carbohydrates, and oftentimes with that, when, when people typically switch to a ketogenic diet, oftentimes they will bump up protein. Um, so surely that can, that can be contributing to that. Um, but Yes, you can gain muscle. Yes, you can lose fat on a ketogenic diet. And the main point of our study was the biggest criticism that people tend to have is, is it just the protein? Is the protein what's really driving the response? Because when you look back at like the Atkins diet and a lot of people who have done studies on low carbohydrate ketogenic diets, protein tends to creep up higher in the quote unquote low carb ketogenic dieting groups than the Western dieting groups. And so they, a lot of people attribute the beneficial effects to higher protein. So we really set out, and, and other studies have done this as well, is what happens when you match that protein? And protein is no different between groups. Do you see some type of uh, beneficial effects on body composition? Okay. And where did you guys come up with? I, let's, let's talk about that study. Yeah. So we really, so we, we did, we had an interesting study design. So 
Again, one of the challenges with doing a ketogenic diet for anyone who's ever done a, a feeding study in humans, um, you know how challenging it can be. Uh, getting people to, first off, college-aged individuals to eat a certain way can be extremely, extremely challenging. And so what most studies will do is they'll print out a sheet and they'll go, here's the list of food you can eat, here's the list of food you can't eat, come back in eight weeks, I'll see you then. And realistically, if you do, if you hand that to a college kid um, and he does that, he might follow that for the first three days, four days. But then eventually once he's sitting at lunch with his friends and he's got some French fries or pizza, like he might be like, oh, well, one slice won't hurt. Right. And so like that's that's really challenging. And that's how a lot of studies work. But we wanted to really we're like if we're going to tackle this issue, we got to do it the right way. And so we had a dietitian work hand in hand with each and every – in both the Western diet and the ketogenic diet groups, um, literally checking with it, with them every single day. Um, uh, they were tracking on something like MyFitnessPal. And so they knew if something went off, if she, if something went off and they didn't track right, that dietitian was on the phone with them almost immediately to make sure, hey, what's going on? How can, how can, how can I work with you? You're looking for a snack. Let me get on board with you. So basically what we did was for two weeks – Prior to us even doing any intervention, we had two groups, one that was on a ketogenic diet group and one that was on a, on, stayed on their traditional Western diet group. So for two weeks, all we changed was their nutrition. We just had that – we just got the ketogenic diet group kind of adapted, what we call keto adapted, to the diet um, in which they were – we were measure, measuring everything from urine ketones to blood ketones, tracking their MyFitnessPal to make sure they were on point. So we took these two groups after two weeks, and then we started the resistance training program for eight weeks. So they had already been on the diet for two, and then we resistance trained them a, a really good. And that's one of the – Dr. Wilson's probably the leading authority, one of the best I've ever come across that can design – proper periodized resistance training programs. That's like, that's what he does. And, and he, and he, we designed a really, really good protocol for these people to optimize both muscle and to lose fat. And so they were training really hard over the course of these eight weeks. And after that 10 week period, so the two week adaptation and the eight weeks of training, we found that the ketogenic dieting group was able to gain just as much muscle as the individuals who are on a Western diet, but they lost significantly more fat mass. So that was a re that was really the, one of the first studies to to investigate it. Yep, and I think one of the interesting things that you guys did was switch a little bit at the last week. Would you want to yeah. delve into that? Yeah. So we did that for so we looked we did the two week adaptation, the eight weeks of training. And then we asked that we, we were like, you know, what, what happens because this often happens with people who do diets is they'll do it for a certain period of time. And then they're like, all right, I'm done. I'm just going to go back to what I was normally eating. So we're like, we already have these groups. Why don't we just look at that? Why don't we reintroduce carbohydrates to this group that was on a ketogenic diet for that last week? So from again, from the first two weeks adaptation, the next eight weeks training hard and staying on the diet. And then the last week, the Western diet stayed the same. They didn't change anything at all. But the ketogenic dieting group reintroduced their carbohydrates and, and, and kind of switched completely back to their original diet that they were on prior to starting the study. And basically what we found was, was really, really interesting. Um, so they actually tended to, to slightly go up in lean body mass, which would be expected with things like glycogen. They're filling out their carbohydrate um, stores are, are, are probably filling out. You're getting a lot of water retention when you measure on, on something like a DEXA. But what happened is they also spilled over a little bit in fat mass and they actually gained a little bit of fat mass according to the DEXA because they reintroduced so fast. Um, so no one's really looked at this. There's a lot, of, a lot more research that needs to be done on this, but it was really the first time that anyone's taken like a long-term ketogenic diet and then rapidly really reintroduced carbohydrates and looked at what kind of effect that has on someone's body composition. Um, well, just uh, some dark humor in there. They did an experiment after World War II, right, if I remember, when people were starving and introduced a lot of carbs really quick and that didn't turn out too well. But um, <laughs> uh, so... Yeah, 
but that was a very fascinating study to me, and I think that raised a lot of eyebrows in the community. And wow, you, you guys like created like this ultimate storm uh, over there. <laughs> that was <laughs> that was you awesome. Do that pretty often. <laughs> yeah. So I think the. The most interesting thing that I noticed from you, which really, really uh, intrigued me towards you guys, was that you guys created more questions than answers at the end, which was very fascinating that, uh, you know, as researchers, you're not, okay, we're not going to set everything in stone. We're going to keep continue to pry pry this. We're going to continue to keep learning. And I think that is a research authority that I love. So, (laughs) Well, thank you. And you know what? That's the the premise of research. And I feel... Oftentimes, as researchers, I often come out of re, uh, of experiments and with more questions and answers because, like you said, nothing is ever absolutely set in stone. Of this, this is absolute. It's always in context under these conditions. This is what happened. Now, how can we take this information and try a different type of study or apply it to a different population and see what happens there? So. I appreciate the support on that. That's that's absolutely what we are looking for. So just to keep uh, stay on this study for just a little bit, uh, what are some of the questions that you have that really need to be checked out as far as this study is concerned? What would what would be your dream? If I gave you like a fifty billion dollars right now, what would you be doing <laughs> right now with this study? Oh man, uh, really, really great question. Um, there's a lot of stuff that needs to be done um, with this. I mean, honestly, I, I'd, I'd take that money and I'd apply it more towards the ketogenic diet for therapeutic applications. I'd, I mean, I'd much rather see a lot more research in that realm because uh, I think there's a huge, huge opportunity um, for a lot of different situations. But as far as performance is concerned, like you said, we're really on the brink of it. Uh, not a lot of people are, are really researching this area and, and doing it in a well-controlled manner. Um, so one of the, our follow-up studies to this is what happens, say, with like a cyclical ketogenic diet and then what happens with a targeted ketogenic diet and is there a way to, quote unquote, people say, have your cake and eat it too. Is there a way that you can kind of get the best of both worlds with reintroducing some carbohydrates at specific times or under certain conditions and you can still maybe enhance performance to another degree yet still get the beneficial effects on body composition. Um, That's an area I'm super interested in exploring. And then obviously one of the things that's grown rapidly and I know we're going to talk about that as well in a little bit is this concept of exogenous ketones and where do they fit into the picture? Where do they fit in regards to not only therapeutic applications, but performance and really from a cognitive aspect, but also a can it increase energy production? Um, that's something that I'm really interested in and excited about kind of diving into even further here in the near future. Awesome. And so just to go off to some research that you guys are working on currently, I believe, is the animal models as far as longevity is concerned in relationship to the ketogenic diet. Would you like to elaborate on that? Yeah. So, you know, we have a lot of great collaborators and and, and colleagues and, you know, a lot of this work wouldn't be possible without them. Uh, And so with that, we have amazing, amazing colleagues at, at Auburn University who are doing fascinating work um, that work, we're working with them on in, in an animal model right now. And so what we decided to do, and, and everyone, like Dr. Wilson and I talked about this, and we talk about it all the time, is like everyone always want you always want your parents or your friends and your family to like live as long as possible. Um, and there's a lot of preliminary data um, in like C. elegans, which are, are a model of worms, that ketones themselves can have effects on, on longevity. And so Dr. Wilson and I sat down one day and we're like, you know what, like what if we pioneered a study um, in which we looked at the effects of a ketogenic diet um, or even exogenous ketones on lifespan and longevity? Like what if we literally took animals and put them on a ketogenic diet like their entire lives? And so we're like, why not do it? Like if we wanted to find it, we're researchers, we're scientists, like let's answer our own question. And so we set out and we, we, we uh, set up an experiment with Dr. Mike Roberts at Auburn University. And the study's still ongoing um, to this day because I'd love to do it in humans, but unfortunately we wouldn't be around to see it. Uh, so <laughs> we have to do it in animals. 
Um, and these animals, it's been over a year that this study has been going on. Um, and the results that we've seen thus far are absolutely incredible, um, to say the least. We basically have – right now, we're kind of like waiting for them to die off, uh, all of these animals. But needless to say, without, without going into too much detail, needless to say, uh, there's over uh, double – the amount of animals who are on a ketogenic diet um, compared to those who are on like the standard American diet who are still alive at this time point. Um, so to say that the results are promising from a lifespan and longevity perspective is likely an understatement. Um, and what we're going to be doing next is we've coll- we've collected all their tissue, their brain, liver, kidney, like everything – um, from these animals. So there's a lot of analysis and a lot of uh, stuff to even look down at the mitochondrial level to see what happens over over time. Um, but really, there's going to be a lot of fascinating and really interesting insights into a lot of the questions that people have is how long should I, should I be on this? Or what does it mean if I were to consuming like a standard American diet and just supplementing with exogenous ketones? So a lot of those questions hopefully can be answered um, throughout these analyses um, with this study. And I'm really, really excited about what we're seeing thus far um, and the potential for what we have for what's coming out. Yes. And I think you guys, I don't know if you've heard of it, but there's this group at UC Davis. They're also looking at something very similar. I think I I saw this talk with Stephen Finney and he was mentioning that over here in Davis, There's a study that is going to be coming out soon as well, as far as longevity is concerned. And um, they don't have the finalized results yet. But I think they're also, I think it's going to be a double whammy effect with you guys. Uh, And um, there were a lot of improvements in, I think, their lifespan and also their muscles in the long run compared to the the hind limb muscles compared to the other groups. So that, that, that was really sort of like a, another thing that's up on the horizon that was very fascinating to me. I don't know if it's the same study. Maybe it is. I don't know. Oh, no, it's great. That's fantastic. And it makes sense from a, there, there are several mechanisms in which, in which I'm postulating that that could happen. Um, but it, it, it makes sense. And I'm, I'm really glad that uh, a lot of other researchers are diving into that area because uh, I mean, really, that's what that's what we need to look at is how can we not only extend the the, the lifespan, but the quality of that life, because because it's one thing to make the time longer, but it's another thing to then have that quality of life um, and the health markers that are associated with that be improved as well. Definitely, definitely. And I think the answer to how does it make me feel as far as keto is concerned, just from without like even without a scientific sort of study, you can find out several communities on Facebook and Reddit where they say it feels amazing. Mm -hmm. Uh, uh, So, yep. Uh, Do you have anything to add? No, absolutely. I love it. Okay. So let's move on to some of the strengths and limitations of ketogenic diet or low carb diet when it comes to athleticism. Have you noticed some of these, these things in the diet? Yeah. You know, so there's definitely, I mean, uh, Dr. Volick's work and, and Dr. Finney obviously in the, in the eighties was doing work on, on endurance athletes. So from a long duration endurance athlete, like I think it makes complete sense, um, to be, to be on a low carbohydrate ketogenic diet. And Dr. Volick is actually working with numerous like ultra marathoners who have seen incredible, incredible results after switching to a ketogenic diet. Um, so for there, it's, it's, it's definitely seems to be beneficial, um, for resistant, for people who are concerned about resistance training. Um, the way I, the way I explain it is this, like if you're extremely, and, and I actually just got back from paleo FX and we're, I, I saw an amazing, uh, talk by, by Rob Wolf and he, he's an amazing, amazing guy and doing amazing work, kind of programming, talking about how nutrition should be individualized based on someone's insulin sensitivity. So I know a lot of athletes who can eat, they can eat cake, cookies, brownies, uh, any kind of candy, and they'll be leaner the next day. Like they're extremely insulin sensitive, 
So for that individual, I mean, it might not be necessary. Like they might be fine eating what they're normally eating, but most people aren't like that. And that's why we kind of dove into this area of research is what about the people who aren't? What about the people who are bodybuilders or fitness enthusiasts and like they don't do well, they, they, they aren't very insulin sensitive or as insulin sensitive as other people, is there a way that they can kind of combat that, still improve, improve their body composition, maintain their performance, and we're seeing that that's, that's absolutely the case. Um, I think there's a huge application for sports in which weight to like power ratios are, are, are beneficial. For instance, there's been studies done in judo athletes um, or in elite gymnasts, Paoli in, in, in 2013 did a study on elite gymnasts um, who were on like a low carbohydrate ketogenic diet and they found that they were able to maintain their performance yet lose weight. So for a wrestler, MMA fighter, uh, gymnast, if you're able to drop weight but still maintain that performance and strength, um, even a power lifter, right? Think about that for a second. Um, people are like, no way, like power lifters eat everything under the sun. They're always eating fast food. But there's actually a recent study that came out of uh, a great lab from New Zealand who looked at like elite uh, weight lifters and power lifters and found that they were able to uh, maintain and, and improve their performance, yet their body composition improved. So again, we need to start thinking about one, how does that affect uh, if, if performance can be maintained or, or even improved? yet we can improve body composition, what does that mean? And then uh, what does that mean even for the life uh, that you're in the sport? Because if you can now say you're healthier overall um, and you're, you have a lower body fat percentage and now you can be in the sport for two, three, four, five more years, that's that's a pretty big impact. Um, so as far as the the downsides, the really where the gray area comes in is what about that middle ground? What about – the athlete who is a sprinter um, or their activity involves some type of sprinting. Um, that's really the area where we aren't, we don't have a lot of research on. Um, a lot of the studies that we've done haven't found negative effects on power um, or any other markers of performance if they are properly adapted. And I think that's the key component is making sure that if we're talking, if we're comparing apples to apples uh, mm -hmm. or avocados to avocados, <laughs> in this case, <laughs> if, we're, if, if we're comparing that, we need to make sure that these studies are properly adapting these individuals um, before they start saying, oh, there's a negative effect on performance. Because if you think about it, we've been, if, if you're doing a study on college age individuals, kids that have been eating for 20 some odd years, a primarily carbohydrate based diet. And then some of these studies take these individuals, switch them over to a ketogenic diet for two, for one or two weeks, see a negative uh, aspect of performance. And then they'll, they'll make the claim, oh, well, ketogenic diets negatively affect performance. It's like they've been on a one diet for 20, 40 years of their life. And now you're going to switch them to a completely separate diet in which they're kind of relying on a totally new fuel source uh, in, in utilizing ketones as fuel um, and for, for a week. And you're going to make a claim that it has a negative effect on performance. Like I don't think we can – I don't think we're there. I don't think we can make that claim unless we properly adapt these people and allow them to truly implement uh, a well-formulated ketogenic diet and allow them that time to adapt. So that gray yep. area is right there in that middle. And you know what's interesting is you brought this important point just, just now that the athlete could gain additional two to three years in their career as well, which made me start to think that there are certain, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, you're the expert, that the ketogenic diet actually reduces uh, inflammation levels and there are certain potential cognitive benefits as well. So... I, I feel like there's feel like <laughs> not scientific. It seems like uh, there's a lot of things that are going in the background, which could enhance the performance than just what you see on, let's say, your muscle gain and your strength gains or those kind of stuff. Does that 
resonate with you by any chance? Without a doubt, without a doubt. And you're absolutely on point. And I think, I think, um, like you're saying, extending the life of the athlete and extending that person's career is essential. And one of the areas in which I'm fascinated by right now, and it's something I'm diving into intimately, and we're working very closely with a lot of athletes is traumatic brain injury. Um, and that's one of the aspects that when we really talk about the life of an NFL athlete being maybe two years, uh, if you think about that and now that two years that they're involved in the game and now they can be affected by just a, a traumatic brain injury for the rest of their lives. And so that's something that we're studying actively right now because what we see with traumatic brain injury, for instance, is you talked about inflammation. But if you were to take the brain, um, and that movie Concussion actually gives a very interesting uh, highlight, an overview of of Dr. Amalu's work. When he looked at these people with CTE, um, stemming from traumatic repetitive head injuries and concussions over the course of their lives um, in the game of football. But if you look at these individuals and you look at their brains, and compare them side by side with someone of Alzheimer's, you probably wouldn't be able to tell the difference. Whoa. And that is scary. That is a scary thought to look at that and go, these individuals at that level, but think about kids who are, do, who are, who are having tra- uh, head trauma over and over again. And then they play in high school and then they play in college and then they play in the NFL. A lot of that, what we feel like, and, and I actually just wrote an article uh, on this, about uh, a former athlete's perspective um, on the what I wish I would have known then, with what I know now, being uh, potentially on the benefits of like even fasting or exogenous ketones or and even a ketogenic diet for people who are playing contact sports. I think that's a huge, huge area to look at because when someone gets that head trauma. There is ample evidence in both, in, in especially in animal models, that have shown that your brain cannot take up glucose as well for several hours to even weeks to months after that head trauma. And so, if you're if you're not able to take up glucose that well in the brain, what's going on? What you can you can you can now start piecing together the puzzle of why certain cells might start dying off, why we might start having um, tangles and plaques starting to build up in the brain over time, possibly do because we're not getting the fuel into the brain that's supposed to be there just from these repetitive repetitive head traumas that we experience in practice and games and things like that. So, I mean, that was kind of long-winded, but like to go to your point, I think I think there's a, a huge application beyond just the body composition but in regards to the life of the game for these athletes, not only in football, but MMA, rugby, even soccer, where they're heading the ball, there's there can be huge, huge benefits that I think we need to really start diving down and researching more. And you know what was fascinating is the last podcast I did with Amy Berger. Uh, it seems like the effects of the brain trauma are probably or could be further compounded by the fact that a lot of the diets that are used by these athletes probably have a lot of carbs in them. And when they're getting close to the event, a lot of uh, people start doing these carb loads and those kind of things to gain that extra energy and power. So I think that might also probably make it worse. So there's a, I feel like there's a lot of dynamics that are in play here that are creating that perfect storm of, uh, for these athletes. Uh, absolutely. You know what? You're, you're absolutely right. Think about it. Um, and I've experienced, I played football all throughout high school. Um, and immediately like you take these hits and, and everyone thinks that what I'm talking about with traumatic brain injury, for instance, everyone thinks, oh, it's that big highlight hit that you see on ESPN or, or some of these big time people where they're getting depleted and they have to get carted off the field. Like, yeah, that's definitely one of them. But really where a lot of the trauma comes is from the repetitive small impacts that like, for instance, offensive linemen get every single play. They're hitting each other every single play and those, t- those type of hits add up. Um, and so what happens is that now they're done, the, their, their series is done, they're going off to the sideline and they have these beverages on the sideline that are loaded in sugar and carbohydrates 
and yet their brain is likely unable to properly and efficiently take up that fuel source and use it. So, I mean, that's a whole nother animal within itself with the traumatic brain injury component. But I'm really, really hoping with with a lot of the recent events that have happened um, in the NFL and, and a lot of these contact sports that this can be something to be looked into. And I think there's an ample opportunity for um, some nutritional and, and even supplemental interventions to try and help these athletes extend their extend their lives and really live a better life beyond the game um, with their family uh, after their time's done in, in with their career yeah and I, I just keep going back to your study again and again thinking about it and it seems like one of the things that people could look into uh, the researchers can look into is uh, maybe having the ketogenic diet like as a uh, backbone and for a re- uh, year-long training session, but once you get closer to your event, you can start maybe adding some carbs to it to get that extra source of uh, energy. I suppose I don't know things to think yeah, about. You know, it's it's an interesting concept of of how should you carb up? Like what if it, like these these carb up um, ideas? And what we know, and we have some preliminary research from the uh, on this is that when you rapidly reintroduce carbohydrates, uh, like for instance, there's this concept of cyclical ketogenic dieting mm-hmm. where some people some people go, oh, well, what's the degree? The degree of cyclical ketosis varies, but basically what it entails is having some certain days where you're keto and then carving up on other days. So we did a study, a preliminary study, where we looked at people who went ketogen- ate a ketogenic diet Monday through Friday and they carved up Saturday and Sunday. And then came, they came around on Monday, they went back to keto. What we and they were basically what we found in in this study was that the individuals who were on a cyclic ketogenic diet lost the same amount of total mass as those who were on a ketogenic diet. Um, so on the surface, people would go, "Wow, they lost the same, there's no difference." But the real question is, what's the composition of that mass? Mm-hmm. So when we looked at the DEXA results, the individuals who were on a cyclic ketogenic diet primarily lost that mass. They were on a calorie deficit, so they primarily lost that mass from lean body mass. Oh. Um, while the individuals who were strict ketogenic dieting group maintained their lean body mass and primarily lost it all from fat mass. Um, so again, the my thought is this on that. The reason being is that these individuals who went ketogenic Monday through Friday and then carved up on the weekends, we measured their blood ketone levels um, and, and, and urine ketones and everything. The, by the time they carved up on the weekend, they weren't back in ketosis until Thursday. They, they were hitting about 0.3, 0.5 millimoles Thursday of the following week. So they were in ketosis Thursday, Friday, and then boom, they just carved back up again. So they were kind of fluctuating in this roller coaster realm of, of they weren't really adapted, and then they really didn't have ketones um, elevated enough to really preserve that muscle during a time of calorie uh, of a calorie deficit. So they lost a, a, a good amount of muscle because of that. And so the, we know that ketones themselves seem to have muscle sparing properties. And because they weren't elevated in that in those individuals, um, I think that's primarily why we saw uh, a loss in lean body mass. Got it. So let's switch gears here a little bit. Let's talk about what's what people can do. Let's say if I have a high intensity sort of resistance event of some sort, not an endurance one. Uh, we can talk about endurance as well, or for example, CrossFit or mm-hmm. of some sort. What can people do to sort of prepare for those kind of things? Is there something you can advise them or recommendations? Yeah. And you know, uh, it's funny you mentioned CrossFit. One of our good colleagues and really good friends, Rachel Gregory, um, just did a study on CrossFit athletes and utilizing a ketogenic diet. Uh, so a lot of people, a lot of people in the CrossFit world really probably are ketogenic at some point with how, uh, how brutal their workouts are. Um, I mean, they're burning a ton, a ton of energy during those, those type of workouts. So they're probably in some degree of ketosis, uh, and most of them eat lower carb anyway. So she's like, well, what if we just put you on a ketogenic diet? Um, so if you have ample amount of time to properly adapt, like in her study, um, like six weeks, 
then I think you can fully be on a ketogenic diet and still perform well uh, during something like a CrossFit competition. Um, I absolutely think that's possible. We also have another colleague of ours who's exploring what if you do this kind of targeted ketogenic diet. And there's some preliminary evidence with MMA fighters that he published. And his name is Jordan Joy. He's doing some incredible work um, down at Texas, Texas Women's University. And he's looking at MMA fighters and what happens if you have MMA fighters who are on a ketogenic diet, but like during their competition, they might throw in, say, right or prior to 30 to 60 grams of carbs, fast digesting carbs, right around that training session. Um, and so that's a very interesting concept as well. And I think, I do think that there's some, some application there um, where people can see some type of benefit if you're training at that high level of intensity and you're, tra- and you're having carbohydrates around that workout period, uh, I think that can be, can be beneficial. And then one of the last aspects I think that uh, people should look into is this concept of exogenous ketones. Um, we're doing a lot of stuff with uh, performance aspects. Dr. Richard Veach uh, in his lab have seen a lot of uh, incredible data with Uh, the dual fuel kind of thought process. He hasn't necessarily been using ketogenic uh, individuals, but he's been taking people who are on a Western diet and seeing tremendous results with his ketone ester. Exactly. And that was going to be the next topic that I was going to talk about is the exogenous ketones, their role in in this. So what's what's going on as far as uh, dual fueling is concerned or people who are on a high carb diet and using ketones or and people who are on a ketogenic diet and using exogenous ketones? What are these two sides of the coin or stories? What's happening with those guys? Yeah, you know, great, great question. Um, so to first to first kind of bridge that gap, I think he's done a lot of work with individuals who are on a uh, traditional diet and supplementing with exogenous ketones. I think from a performance perspective, I think there's a lot of other uh, uh, aspects about it. But the way to really look at ketones are they are a fuel source um, straight up. Like if you're looking at uh, we, we kind of term them the fourth macronutrient. You have fats, you have carbs, you have proteins, and ketones are really their own macronutrient in some aspect because they are, they are utilized as a fuel source. There's a calorie component to them. Um, so with the performance aspect, he's seen in cyclists uh, incredible results with um, the use of his ketone esters or even supplemental, just regular supplemental ketones on performance. Um, So there's varying different types of ketones. There's ketone esters, which aren't really only available in the research world. And then the other type that have been blowing up all over um, everywhere almost now you see them is is ketone salts. Um, And those are being used a lot more in research. And that's really what we're doing a lot of research on are these ketone salts and what impact they have on on performance uh, and a variety of other markers. But I think from a perspective of someone who isn't even on a ketogenic diet, they can still see a a cognitive performance benefit with exogenous ketones. And we've seen that um, as long as, uh, as well as other studies have looked at um, the cognitive aspect of being able to improve things like reaction time. Uh, We saw that in individuals who weren't on a ketogenic diet, but supplementing with exogenous ketones actually had uh, decreased fatigue uh, compared to individuals who weren't supplementing with exogenous ketones. So they may allow that individual to potentially push push past their barriers um, where they would normally stop. They may be able to continue going. So I think there's definitely an application there. Um, the biggest question that people have is, what if I'm on a ketogenic diet, right? And I'm sure you've gotten this question a lot um, as well is, what if I'm on a ketogenic diet? Do I need to supplement with exogenous ketones as well? Um, we actually did a study in animals where we looked at animals who were on a ketogenic diet and animals who are on a ketogenic diet and supplementing on top of that with exogenous ketones. Basically what we found was that the individuals who did both were on a ketogenic diet and supplementing with exogenous ketones had an increase in something known as brown fat. Um, and you, I'm sure you've talked about this a lot before is 
the importance of brown fat should never be un- understated. It's it's very important. It's a type of fat that we want. Um, typically, what we see uh, in individuals who are overweight or obese is white fat, which isn't the type of fat that we want. But brown fat's thermogenically active tissue. Um, it burns kind of a lot of calories. And so we want that. And so we saw that the individuals who are the animals who are supplementing with exogenous ketones had more brown fat. And on top of that, their feed efficiency, which is the amount of calories they consumed divided by the amount of weight that they gained, um, was less. So these animals were eating the same amount of food as the individuals who are on a standard American diet or even on the ketogenic diet, but they were gaining less weight. Um, which is really, really interesting um, when you start thinking about what type of metabolic impact do exogenous ketones have. It, it could be driven by what we saw in the improvements in brown adipose tissue. And that's an interesting topic that I, if we have a few minutes, we can, if, if you can elaborate further on that. What's going on? What, is, what do you think is going on as far as this uh, collection of adip- brown adipose tissue in the body through exogenous ketones? Yeah, so uh, it's a, it's a, it's a fascinating uh, concept with with what ex- I think we're really just starting to realize the potential um, and really what exogenous ketones do, what they don't do, and how they can be utilized for various situations. Um, we definitely see an increase in brown adipose tissue. We've seen that, and then a lot of earlier work, even dating back to like the '70s and '80s, have seen increases in brown adipose tissue with ketones. Um, Part of that could be that we know that ketones themselves uh, enhance insulin sensitivity. Um, So they've done infusion studies where they've literally infused ketones into someone and found that their insulin sensitivity went up, um, which is exactly what we want. We want people to be more insulin sensitive. Um, So that's that's a key component. And then most recently, there was an early study that we tried to replicate as well um, in animals and we found that ketones themselves, um, specifically beta-hydroxybutyrate, can actually increase muscle protein synthesis um, and by itself. So we typically think, and muscle protein synthesis is really the, the motor, the, the engine for what stimulates muscle growth. Um, so again, these ketones seem to have unique properties uh, within themselves in that they're able to stimulate muscle protein synthesis. They're having some type of effects on brown adipose tissue, enhancing insulin sensitivity. Um, we know that uh, when you uh, give either orally or infuse, there's studies that have been shown that when ke- when you give ketones, it actually decreases hunger and appetite. Um, so theoretically, people are maybe these people that are taking these uh, supplements are eating less, so that could be driving um, a lot of the response. So again, and then and then lastly, this is one of the most fascinating areas. I mean, I, I know it's kind of all over, but the, the lastly, these ketones are signaling molecules. It's like they're a fuel source. Um, they're they're having all these beneficial effects, but they're also signaling molecules. So uh, ketones, uh, there's a great paper. Great paper. It's called Ketones as Signaling Molecules. And they talk about ketones impact as far as HDAC inhibition. Um, And that within itself is is a fascinating area. Basically, in in brief, what HDAC does is as we age, and this could be what's driving a lot of the lifespan and longevity, is as we age, we have things known as histones that, that basically wrap themselves around our DNA and uh, and basically, it's kind of like a, think about like a boa constrictor. It wraps itself around the DNA and squeezes it, so the DNA can't express any of its genes anymore. And then it's kind of like, well, okay, I'm I'm done. I'm dying off. Well, histo- Well, if you have a HDAC inhib- inhibitor like ketones, um, beta hydroxybutyrate is an HDAC inhibitor. It could be that it's blocking that process from happening. So genes can still express themselves as we age. And so that's where I think a lot of these signaling molecules and metabolites and processes that are happening with ketones is is so unexplored and something that we definitely need to get more research on um, because it's absolutely fascinating and could be a large driving force behind what we're seeing. Yeah. The only gripe I personally have with the ketones, I personally don't, but <clears throat> the 
expense, they're a little bit on the pricey side. Are we going to get them cheaper eventually as the demand increases? Uh, you know, that's a great question. Um, it's a really, really great question. I think I, I think the more they're out there, um, if you think about when ketones were first created, um, I remember when I first started hearing about ketogenic dieting, there was, I think it might have been Ben Greenfield was talking about how uh, he paid like two thousand dollars for one serving of a of a ketone ester, like it Ouch. Was something insane, because that's how rare it was. Um, but to see it come um, from where it has to where to where it is right now, I think it's it's definitely got potential. Um, hopefully, to to get in the hands of more and more people, so hopefully it can get uh, decreased. The only thing that scares me is is I really hope that with this. Uh, information and it's going to take a lot of education of what ketones do and what they don't do is that companies don't sacrifice quality um, and with that be, we see that in the supplement world no matter what if it's ketones if it's creatine if it's BCAAs there's there's going to be people who are getting exogenous ketones that sacrifice quality um, and because of that you're going to have companies who are putting putting exogenous ketones into their product just because it's a buzzword. And you're going to see companies putting 500 milligrams or a gram of exogenous ketones and likely won't, won't have any effect whatsoever because they're not inducing – they're not elevating ketones to any significant degree. Um, so that's one of the challenges we're definitely going to see and face uh, over the course of the, of the upcoming months, I feel like. it's I feel like a new supplement's coming out every single day. But months to years is making sure that we're properly educating on what they are and what they aren't and then how to look for quality. If they are having an effect, how do you then look for a quality source um, that isn't cutting corners and doing things the right way? And I think one of the homeworks that you guys will have is the dosage of beta-hydroxybutyrate for people. Right now, it seems like they're there's plenty of uh, like 10 grams, 5 grams, 6 grams, 12 grams, but we don't know exactly how that affects the, or do we? Do we know how like X grams of exogenous ketones will raise 0.1 or 0.2 percent of, of, of ketones in people? But the problem, just before you can answer, seems like that everybody has their own mechanism of raising and lowering ketones. So that seems like a monkey wrench in the cogs. Yes, Big time, and you 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 bring up a really really uh, big question that a lot of people have. Um, but to start, you're absolutely right. Everyone's individualized, and everyone's their own uh, study in some aspect. I could, I, I we've done this in the lab. I can give 15 people in our lab 10 grams of the same ketone, and everyone will get different different measures. And the reason at different blood millimole levels, and the reason that is, is everyone's different. Um, for like, if I've been on a ketogenic diet for a long period of time, and and my cells are sensitive, and I have greater transport capacity to take up and utilize ketones, I might be clearing them very fast, so my blood ketones may not go up. Whereas someone who's eating a ton of carbs usually and isn't as sensitive to, to their body's not really recognizing, hey, uh, I'm not sure what these what these ketones are. I don't really produce them that often. Um, they take it, they might jump two millimoles, three millimoles um, in some regard. So you bring up a, a, a really great point that higher is not always better um, in, in that aspect. People, people are completely individualized using things differently. But one of the things that's a huge topic um, really within itself, you could do an entire podcast on this, is the different isomers of ketones. Um, so basically the ketone salts, uh, there's, there, there's most of them that are out on the market today are racemic um, in that there's two isomers. There's a D isomer and an L isomer bound together and um, of two beta like of beta hydroxybutyrate bound to some type of mineral salt, whether it's sodium, calcium, magnesium, um, or what have you. What we're finding um, in our lab, as well as a lot of the previous, a lot of just previous research that we've come across, is that one of those isomers is actually the active component, is really driving the response that, and the other one's kind of inert. And we see this, this isn't new, we see this with amino acids, like you see 
L-citrulline or L-leucine. Like you see these these different ice. Those are all different isomers. And the best way I explain it is like Tetris. Um, when you're when you when you're playing a game of Tetris, um, there's certain blocks and shapes that fit perfectly into um, the hole, and there's some that kind of fit, but they there's still some empty space. The active isomer with with ketones in beta hydroxybutyrate is the D isomer, um, D beta hydroxybutyrate. And Dr. Veach talks a lot about this. Um, and he's done several podcasts on it, but the D beta hydroxybutyrate is the one that fits perfectly into that hole and is, and is really responsible for a lot of the, um, effects that we see the L isomer, which, um, really is kind of inert in some aspect. It's not really doing much. Um, there's some preliminary data that it's, it still gets transferred and converted over to D beta hydroxybutyrate. But in essence, the D beta hydroxybutyrate is really what's driving a lot of the response. So to go back to your question, it depends. It depends if someone's using the racemic version, um, the DL form of beta hydroxybutyrate, it, they might have to use double or triple the amount that someone, if someone's just using the raceme, or the, the D form by itself, um, because that's the potent and active isomer that's driving that response. Whereas the DL form, you're not really getting that same response. Maybe 50% or less is really what's responsible and, and is driving that, that response that you're looking for. Awesome. And this leads me to the next question, which is, let's say if I'm a consumer, how do I find out that this is actually a good exogenous ketone supplement? Oh, great, great, great question. The key things that I look for, and this is something that I tell people, even if they ask me about everyday supplements, BCAAs or protein, the biggest thing you want to look for is products that are tested, first and foremost. I mean, if a company is willing to put their product to the test with research, with third-party testing, if they're getting uh, things like informed choice certifications, like that's truly where I look for and I go, that's a quality product. Um, that, And I think that's that's really what stands apart from other people. Um, we've done a lot of research with prove it for instance. And, and the reason why we're able to do that is because their ingredients are tested out, um, informed choice. And I know they have a lot of ongoing clinical trials, uh, across the, the United States right now. Um, so for me, that's what I look for from a standpoint of regardless if it's a ketone supplement, but for anything that you're looking for, you want to be educated in a sense of know, knowing that they're putting uh, dollars into research to test it, to make sure it's third party approved, to make sure they're testing things out. But also, be, when you're looking at these ingredient labels, if regardless of what the supplement is or who the supplier is, look for, for, look for um, blends and look for dosages. And the, the challenge is a lot of these uh, ketone supplements right now ha are formulated in the form of a blend. So they'll be form it'll be beta hydroxybutyrate with MCTs with other as other amino acids and, and things like that. They'll put it they'll package it all into one blend. And so it becomes very challenging from a consumer standpoint to figure out how much of the active ingredient that I'm looking I'm really looking for ketones, if that's what you're looking for, in this product. Well, to kind of help you out, keep in mind that a properly, and not all of them are, are, are properly labeled, but a proper supplement facts label in a blend like that, the way they're listed in that blend is in order of uh, how much is in that product. Say for instance, I have a blend of 10 grams of material. If I, if it, the first ingredient in there is MCTs and then the second one is, um, uh, I don't know, uh, isoleucine and then you have, uh, glycine and all these uh, and creatine. And then for the fourth ingredients, beta hydroxybutyrate, well, all the beta hydroxybutyrate is the fourth greatest ingredient that's in there. So there's probably primarily MCTs and those other amino acids. And then there might be one or two grams of that beta hydroxybutyrate. So look for, look for things like that in proprietary blends, make sure that beta hydroxybutyrates towards the front, um, or ideally, hopefully they list it out to let you know what, how much is in it. But if it's in the front 
or towards the, the top of that list for proprietary blends, um, that's a good sign that you can kind of give an estimate of, all right, well, if the proprietary blend as a whole is this amount, at least beta hydroxybutyrate is making up the majority of it. Got that it. Helps. Yeah, that, that was very informative. Now, here's an interesting question that could be asked by people who are in the world of performance and athleticism is how does beta hydroxybutyrate work in, if at all, in synergy with other things like, let's say, creatine or just MCD powder? Or, I mean, we, we just talked about blends, so there must be something, mm -hmm. some reason why they're doing it. Yeah, you know, there's. I think there's a lot of things that can be synergistic uh, with beta hydroxybutyrate. Uh, and again, we need a lot more research into what its what its capacity is for performance for um, various therapeutic modalities. Um, but for instance, one of the key things is is caffeine. I mean, one of our really good uh, collaborators, Dr. Stephen Kunain, just did a study where he found that caffeine is actually ketogenic. It can it can enhance the production of ketones. So I think putting caffeine with with beta hydroxybutyrate now you're now you're increasing an endogenous or inside your body's production of ketones plus um, exogenous ketones. And then you have other uh, like ketogenic amino acids. There's only two amino acids out of out of all the amino acids that we have, there's only two that are purely ketogenic and that's leucine and lysine. And, and I speculate that if you take a high enough dosage of leucine and lysine, they probably can actually convert over to beta hydroxybutyrate and actually increase ketone production. So I think, and, and both of them are very good amino acids. I mean, we know that leucine is the primary amino acid that's driving uh, skeletal muscle protein synthesis. So if that's the case, I think there's definitely synergy with caffeine, um, with a with the proper form of beta hydroxybutyrate um, and some of these ketogenic amino acids, and then of course um, potentially even pairing it with with some uh, ketogenic fats, whether that's short chain fatty acids, medium chain fatty acids um, like MCTs or coconut oil, or even something like butyrate. Got it. Wow. <laughs> This is a lot of information for a lot of people. <laughs> so, so one quick question, just to kind of backtrack just a little bit, is what in your definition, what is, what's your definition of fat adaptation? What would you call it? Oh, man. You know, I think it's truly where your body switches over from primarily using glucose as fuel to now relying so uh, primarily on fat and uh, ketones as its primary fuel source. And the biggest thing is that uh, I don't think keto adaptation is a process that can happen in a week. Um, I think we can, I think a part of it can, but true keto adaptation, we're seeing adaptations that take place months, years after someone's been on a ketogenic diet. So yes, you can become adapted. I think you become fat adapted, um, very quickly. Uh, if, you, if, if you're exercising hard, you're depleting glycogen stores, you incorporate things like intermittent fasting, um, and you're eating a, like a well-formulated ketogenic diet. I think you can become adapted fairly quickly, but I don't think those adaptations stop um, until several months and potentially even years out. Got it. And I, and I was I was in the same boat thinking the same way that there, it's just a big gray area of uh, where people can hit that marker. And it seems like it's a journey of continuously improving, adapting, getting better, your body adjusting. And uh, so, but then again, I'm not a researcher. I'm not a scientist, I'm just a humble human no, being. You're, you're, you're absolutely right. No, you're absolutely right. And I think you're on point with everything you're thinking. Got it. Now, uh, so let's, uh, I think we've delved into the future of research. Um, if you want to touch bases again on anything else that potentially you guys want to work on, we can talk here. If not, we can move to another question. Yeah, you know what? I just think it's fascinating. Um, on that research component, each day I get emails coming into, I, I, I have Google Scholar and I, I sign up for these alerts. And every single day, like to this morning, I just posted a study on the potential applications for ketogenic diet for um, things like headaches, uh, long-term headaches. And so I think that's, it's, it's, it's just amazing and fascinating the 
potential avenues that these are going down, this research realm is going down, everything from Parkinson's to Alzheimer's to um, traumatic brain injury to performance, like it's amazing uh, and we need more of it to get a better understanding of, you know what, it might not be applicable here. It really might not, it might not be the best, um, but here's where it might be, or this type of uh, modified ketogenic diet might be better for under these conditions for epilepsy. Well, that's great. Let's get that information. Let's get that research out there um, and get it out so we can start practically implementing it. I mean, we've known for how we've known since the 19 early 1900s, 1920s, um, when they first started implementing fasting for epilepsy, that a ketogenic diet can be beneficial for uh, individuals who have epilepsy, and yet oftentimes it's still not like I've uh, like Dr. Wilson's cousin died with epilepsy and had never ever gotten recommended or even knew what a ketogenic diet was. And so for me, like that shows me and 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 points out how far we still have to go and what we and in getting this message out there from and getting. Uh, doctors kind of on board and, and, and getting a better understanding of where it can be utilized um, and where it might not be beneficial to utilize. And I take that as a an obligation for us as researchers to hopefully do a better job at getting this information, gathering it, collecting it, and then getting that out to the world. And I really appreciate like like what you're doing, everything that you're putting out is very, very important because that's what it's going to take to get a lot of this research out to the world and allow us to really start implementing and utilizing it to a larger degree. Got it. So one of the things that you do besides just research is you're an excellent speaker, you're a public figure, you're guiding people. So what is your, what do you think is going on and what could you recommend our millennial generation? I believe you're a millennial, I'm a millennial. So th my point of view is what are some of the challenges that people are facing in general? I know it's just shifting the whole thread somewhere else as far as the topic is concerned, but that's one thing I really wanted to talk about as well with you. Oh, well, thank you very much. I really appreciate that. And, you know, the biggest thing I would say as a millennial, um, or even just anyone, it doesn't, it doesn't even matter um, how old you are, or if you're coming up, or if you're well established, really, the a reason why I've, I've been able to do what, I, what I've done this far is I'm surrounded by incredible people. I really am. Like, the network, the team that I work with on an everyday basis, um, the support that I have from family, friends, and colleagues, and then the people I look up to, heroes, idols, mentors that I've had along the way, have really allowed me and, and have paved the path for me to guide me in the direction that, that I'm going and that I hope to continue to go in inspiring other people and, and spreading this message. So one of my biggest tips would be Find great mentors, find people who are doing exactly what you want to do um, and try and just be around them. Like being in close proximity, um, staying in contact with them, you'd be very surprised at the people you look up to or the people that you'd want to be like one day, how much time they'd be willing to give you, jump on a phone call, even fly, if, even if you're at a conference to take five minutes just to ask them, Hey, what was your, what was your path? How did you get to where you've gone to? And, and that's what I've done my entire life. Like one of my, uh, great mentors is, is an individual named Sean Wells. And he's literally the number one formulator in the world. And I become incredible friends. And now he's like family, um, to me. And he's one of my mentors along with obviously Dr. Wilson and a lot of the colleagues and people I work with every single day, have just been incredible, incredible mentors and and gu have provided guidance for me in whichever aspect I go. And I think it extends beyond just research. It really is character. And I think that's one of the biggest aspects is building somewhat – you can be a brilliant, brilliant researcher, but at the end of the day, what truly matters is your character and how you deal and, and work with other people. And um, I'm a big, big proponent of positivity. I think we live in a world that is 
surrounded by negativity, whether it's on media outlets or people trying to beat down and, and drag other people down. So like w- the message that I try and do, and I'm inspired by, by Gary V talks about this a lot is literally make positivity louder. Um, that's my biggest compo- proponent of, of that is how do we take this message of what we're doing in research or what we're doing in, in everyday lives and spread positivity? Cause you'd be amazed at how many people are drawn to positivity and how much that'll change someone's life just by making that small impact that you think is small, but it can make the world of an impact in someone's life if you literally just change their perspective of how they look at the world or how they look at a certain situation and change it from what was a negative to really start looking at it from a positive aspect. Got it. Uh, one person's struggle could be another person's challenge. <laughs> so, Absolutely. Uh, Absolutely. Just to, to kind of pry you a little bit on the humor side and throw you off a little bit. Um, <laughs> if, uh, if you were a superhero, what kind of superpower you have? And you can't use that I would like to have unlimited research funding. <laughs> that would be nice. That would be nice. Wow, that's a, that's a tough one. Um, you know, I would love, I love traveling. Um, I love traveling because at the end of the day, um, life is made up of experiences. Um, and what you make of those experiences is what truly matters. So, um, I'd love to be able to fly, I'd say, um, in a sense, because there's multiple things that I think like my favorite super, super, uh, uh, human, so to speak is, is, uh, Superman. I love, I'm a big, big superhero fan and, and Superman is my favorite and like being able to fly, I'd love to be able to travel the world and in doing so help other people, um, travel the world with me and, and be able to see family or friends that they would have otherwise never been able to see or, or, or be around. I think that would be an amazing, amazing component is, um, taking people to worlds or situations in which they never might have seen. Um, and ex- having those experiences is truly, and making those memories is truly what makes life worth living uh, and really what encompasses and, and, and really brings about what life truly is all about is those experiences, those memories, and sharing them with people that you care about and love. And that's one of the things I'm super passionate about. So I would I would love to be able to fly and experience and, and make memories with uh, people and help help others make similar memories. And it works with your persona as well as a researcher, quite like Superman. You can do, go to your fortress or fortress of solitude or your research lab and just chill there and figure out stuff. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. <laughs> so we're uh, going to the conclusion. If I've missed out on either, anything, please let me know. And uh, if not, w- one last thing would be. In the future, what do you see? What is your vision? Mm, wow, that's, that's, that's big. You know, our mission at ASPI is to change lives through science and innovation. So we are at a point right now in society and, and, and in the world that we're seeing a paradigm shift. And that shift is happening in multiple areas. Um, but people are becoming more well-informed. Um, which is a great thing. I think education is one of the most powerful tools in the world when properly done. And so I think we're, and hopefully what we're doing at ASPI and what we plan to do is, I think we're going to see big changes in the game. I think from an educational standpoint, the, the education of sitting in a classroom for an hour and a half and learning about a topic that you may never apply in your life, because I've sat through numerous, uh, plenty of classes myself that I will never, ever utilize in my entire life. I think we're going to see a shift where people are more focused on, rather than sitting and learning from a textbook, let me dive in. Let me let me get around it. Let me get involved um, and be a part of it, because some of the most successful people that I've ever been around, learned from, literally have learned what they do on a daily basis from just getting involved and learning on the fly. Um, And that's something that I found is that 
for instance, even with the ketogenic diet, like you can read a ton on it. You can listen to people talk about it, but you really start learning the most about it when you actually jump in and do it yourself. Um, and so I think that's one of the biggest paradigm shifts um, that we're going to see is that people want more education. We're seeing a, a very well-informed consumer. Um, so how do we provide information, take information uh, in an easy, understandable, digestible manner that they can then take and utilize um, in the future for themselves, for their family, and for their friends now and in the future? And I think that's a paradigm shift we're going to start seeing more and more is get, how do we take these complex topics and get this information out there um, sooner rather than later so it's not two years, three years down the road when we knew something back in 2015 and it's just now coming to light. Well, that's two years that could have changed people's lives. How do we get that information out earlier and impact those people a lot quicker? Got it. And that, I think, is very commendable is creating that bridge between the complexities and intricacies that a lot of people don't have the time. For example, if I'm a doctor, I have, uh, well, I don't know, but let's say if I work somewhere, if I have a job, a nine to five job, I don't have the time to delve into every single research paper, but I can definitely go to my Instagram, follow ESPI, by the way, we're going to get into the plug part, and um, then look at all the infographics, look at all the information that has been extracted out and you guys right. are just amazing. <laughs> oh, well, thank you very much. I appreciate that, man. And it's honestly, it's a great, it's great to be around like-minded people. And I'm glad you had Amy on and, and Luis and uh, I love what they're, the work that those two are doing as well. And everything that you're putting out is absolutely phenomenal. And it, it takes those, the group of like-minded people uh, who are supportive and really positive and, and trying to impact a change who are the ones that are crazy enough to really change this world. So I appreciate you and I appreciate you taking the time. Thank you so much. I think if we continue this discussion, we're going to start patting each other on the back for the next hour. <laughs> <laughs> so just to conclude, so how can people reach out to you? Do you want to plug? Please feel free to plug everything. No, yeah. So um, I guess my, like obviously the ASPI.com, you can see where we do a lot of our research and, and everything that we're doing um, is on there. Uh, my personal Instagram is at Ryan P. Lowry, um, R-Y-A-N-P-L-O-W-E-R-Y. Um, and then we do a lot of different stuff, uh, a lot of great graphics just on like training and nutrition uh, with the Muscle PhD. And that's Dr. Jacob Wilson's um, Instagram as well. He does a lot of infographics there as well. And he does more on, um, the training side. So how to optimize your training, um, and just general overall nutritional principles. And that's the muscle PhD. So at Ryan P Lowry and at the muscle PhD, um, there's just a lot of information and anything that we can do ever. If there's any questions, I, Oh, I always try and get back to people, whether they're in a DM, uh, or email or anything like that. Like, I want to be a resource for people and I know oftentimes that people are afraid to reach out and ask and I never would want to have anyone be afraid to reach out to me either on Facebook, Instagram or email. Um, please feel free to reach out and hopefully I'll get back to you uh, pretty quickly and, and be able to answer your question. Yeah, wait till you exponentially grow into the celebrity and then we'll see how responsive <laughs> you are. <laughs> Uh, I'll make it. I'll make the time. Um, so, yeah, thank you so much, Ryan, for showing up on this podcast. You guys have tons of information and a lot of video content as well. Uh, please reach out to him and blast him now that he has an open invitation. Uh, and I think <laughs> <laughs> that's about it. So once again, thank you so much, Ryan. And thank you. Thanks to everyone for listening as well. Thank you. Thank you for listening to this episode. Please subscribe to our podcast on iTunes and leave us a review if you liked it. You can check out our products at www.ketogeek.com and use our coupon code KGLAUNCH, all caps, for a $5 off of all our food products. You can also follow us on Twitter and Facebook. And if you want to join our community, we have a growing Facebook group as well. Till next time. <laughs>